How's everybody doing? Great. Before we get started, I just want to, uh, well, let me pray first. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you honor and glory. Father, we thank you for your word and for your promise, God, where you said, Lord, where two or three gathered, God, that you would be in the midst. And so, Lord, we need you this morning, God. God, I need you personally this morning, God, to help me, to guide me, to speak to me, to teach me, God, to, uh, to disciple me, to discipline me, Lord, to, to keep me on, on, a, on a right path, God. Amen. God, I need you, Lord. And Lord, this morning, even as I, I speak this word, God, I pray, God, that you would give me the words to speak, God. God, I can't do anything without you, nor do I want to. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would bless us today, God. Uh, as we're already blessed singing a song, Lord God, let our, our life be a song to you, God. Father, uh, so we just pray, God, that, that you would be amongst us and with us, and because your promise, we know that you are. And Lord, we just ask for revelation, Lord. I pray that you would uh, fill me with your spirit, God. Give me divine, uh, Lord God, understanding and revelation of what I'm saying today, God. God, and, and, and let it make sense. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wanted to um, ask a question, just to throw it out there. Um, What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word uh, President Trump? And uh, that's a question that I'm asking, and I'm open to answers. Uh, God spared us from Hillary. What did you say? <laughs> God spared us from Hillary. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, just instrument. Instrument. Uh, instrument. Truthfully, I always say, pray for the Yes. What? His hair is his face. His hair is what? His hair or his face. His hair or his face. So that's what we that's what we think that when we hear Trump. I, I have one more. Okay. There's some I hope. Okay. My that the hope that he will that he'll receive Christ that he'll know Christ. Amen. Yeah, that's. Amen. I'm just gonna add to my word instrument the instrument of God's mercy and at the right, right time. Right. That's what I think when I think. Mm. Amen. You know, because what I, what I have experienced lately <coughs> as in a Christian world setting, you know, uh, not even speaking about the, the uh, unsaved, but, you know, the first thing that happens when you bring up the name Trump is mm. hatred. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Hatred. Mm. You know, and I, I was amazed that you can't even post anything that has anything to do with Trump or you'll be targeted. That's right. You know, you get these, you know, Facebook is unfiltered. You got saved and unsaved, and there's people that, that are, they have a, a, a understanding of who they feel Trump is, and, and that's all they see. You know, as Christian believers, the, the Lord says that, the Bible says that, you know, that he sets our leaders in place. And, and as Christian believers, you know, we have to say that, okay, so I might not like this man, or, or, believe, or I might not, well, I shouldn't say that, we might think, I might not agree or understand who this man is or, or the things that he has done in the past but what I do have to understand as a Christian that God placed him there to be our president to be our leader and, and we in honoring God we need to honor our president and there has been no president that ever took step foot in the White House that was perfect mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. never was a president that stepped foot in they all had issues every one of them and so Trump is no different and yeah, he has a past, but so is everybody else that is, is passing judgment on him. Mm -hmm. And so last night mm -hmm. I posted uh, something because, you know, everybody's been ranting about these children in cages. Right, right, right. And it's to the point like, okay, already, you know what I mean? Can we just... But I think it's an issue that, that needs to be dealt with. And what people fail to understand is this is not something that Trump built. This is not a, 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 an issue that Trump said, I'm just gonna separate people and put them in a kid, get kids in a cage and, and send their parents off. This has been happening for way before Trump even decided to run for president. Mm -hmm. right. It's been happening way longer. And so what people don't understand is, is Clinton, Clinton passed that law. Obama, he, uh, he what's the word? He, um, he upheld it. And, then, and, and now Trump is, is just following the law you know, of the, that's been set in place. And so, but because of the hatred that, that society has for Trump, things have been exposed. Mm -hmm. Issues have been exposed. And, and, and all that hatred, and I look at, this is the revelation that God gave me uh, the other day. He says, I'm using the hatred of, of, that America has for their president to raise up issues. Because they, they didn't hate Obama. 
they didn't, so they didn't challenge him. They didn't question him. They didn't hate Clinton, so they didn't question him. They didn't challenge him. But because they hate President Trump, they're, they're, they're questioning him and they're challenging him. They're bringing up all these things and gossips and in all that hate, I'm going to cause it to, to raise up some issues that humanity needs to deal with. Mm -hmm. So see, God, even, even in the midst of chaos and in the midst of hatred, God's still there and God still has a plan. Yeah. And, you know, and when God brought president into Trump, he understood that, you know what, when I bring this man into presidency, when I bring this man into office, certain, certain uh, things are going to be exposed that need to be dealt with mm -hmm. as humanity. Amen. And so God took that hatred and he, put, he fueled it. He used it to say, okay, so society wants to say we hate Trump. He's putting children in cages and he's separating families. And, and they're posting these videos of children crying for their parents that were recorded years ago. And pictures of kids that are in cages that happened 12 years ago and 10 years ago. And they're posting pictures that are in uh, Iraq. And they're not even, they has nothing to do with the children here at our borders. And, and they're using these pictures, and because the American eye sees it, and they say, this is what's happening now. Instead of understanding, that's what the Bible says, because of the lack of knowledge, people perish. Mm -hmm. And so, see, they're seeing all these pictures that are, what, they're seeing pictures of children going through these uh, horrible atrocities, and not realizing that that was under your president that you loved. Mm -hmm. right. That was under your president that you loved eight years before him. Right. These children were still being as put in cages. They were still being separated. Their families were still being torn apart. But where was the outcry? Where was the outrage? Mm -hmm. But because you had so much hatred for your president today that God says, I'm going to use this hatred and everything that they bring up, I'm going to allow it to be exposed. Mm -hmm. So now, church, where are we at? Mm -hmm. What do we do with this information that's been exposed? What are we doing? What is society doing? God doesn't allow uh, things to, to, to be exposed and to just sit there to be exposed. Mm -hmm. You know, what are we going to do, church? You know, and so I posted last night about, uh, you know, about uh, the Clinton, and Obama, and then, pre and then President Trump. And I got a lot of, uh, you know, people were saying, S Eli, stick to preaching. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know nothing about politics. And, 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 you know, and back and forth. And these are educated people, but these are also people that are pro-abortion. They're uh, for homosexuality. They're for uh, everything that's ungodly and against God. But they're very intelligent. And so I'm careful how I respond to them because they will start bringing up things that, I have, that are way over my head. Uh. And so basically what I said, I said, is you're missing my point. I'm not talking, this is not about presidents. It's not about borders. It's about humanity. It's about children being in cages. It's about children being stolen, kidnapped, sold into sex trafficking. It's about children that are being kidnapped, stolen, and, and, and forced into uh, sexual uh, perversions, satanic rituals, and sacrificing it's bigger than presidency. It's bigger than, than the border. You know, the, all these things that are happening, and it, it's, it's a, you know, where's the outcry? Where's the outcry? You know, and it, but because, you know, we post things on Facebook, all they see is their hatred. They can't see past the hatred. All they see is, you know what, I hate this man. I want him to, to uh, I want four years to hurry and come. I want him to be impeached. I want him to be, to walk out of the White House. All these different things. It's not about the issues. Mm -hmm. It's not about the issues. It's about we hate President Trump, mm -hmm. and we're going to do and expose anything that we can to make him look ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it's not about the issues. If it was about the issues, it would have been about the issues before Trump came in, when Obama was in president. Yeah. If it was about the issues, they would have did something when, it was, when Clinton passed the bill. Mm -hmm. Telling the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about the president. It's about the issues. It's about the heart of humanity. We don't care really about those children being separate. I mean, th what they care about is that, you know what, we want a president that's going to that's gonna say what we want him to say. We want a president that, that's going to pass bills that we can live however we want to live. That's, that's, right. mm -hmm. that's, that's really right. what we want. And we don't want a president that's going to put down law or we don't want a president that's going to that's gonna put, you know, board, not only borders, like the borders, but he's going to put limits on what the people can do, what laws will be passed. And President Trump, he's not the issue. Right. He's not the issue. It's, it's, there's a spirit in America. Mm -hmm. There is a spirit in America that has taken over, and it's not about the issues. It's about we want we want to do it our way. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. We want to do it, and don't aren't we just repeating our past? Even in the Old Testament, they wanted a king. They wanted somebody over them. They had the God. They had the Lord, but they wanted something else. You know, and, and here in today's age, you know, we don't want a president that's going to stick to anything that has anything to do with the Bible. We want a president to say, you know what? Just live in chaos. 
do whatever you want to do. It's all about you. And, and basically, what we're saying is, we want a president that worships the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We want a person. We want a president over the United States that will say, you know what? We follow the satanic beliefs. Do what thou will. You're your own god. You're the center of law because that's really what it is. You can't have an opinion without offending somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't. If you have an opinion, you're going to offend somebody, and they want to make it illegal. So what can we? We're, they're trying to almost program us. You can't think. You can't think. You can't have an opinion. You're going to offend somebody. Just keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. But somebody else can have an opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Somebody else can have an opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, and what I was doing was, I have a message, but I'll get to it in a minute. This is just stuff that was coming up. And so, so what I did was I contacted, um, I contacted California Family um, Council. And what they're doing is they're fighting the, to, they're fighting to, uh, to the bill. It's called AB 2943. You know, because they're trying to legal, they're trying to make it illegal to preach Jesus to people, you know, as a form of help. And so, if this law passes, we can't preach the Jesus Christ. We can't outreach. We can't evangelize community, society. You know, we can't do it. And so, there's this is a this is a group of people that they're fighting to to uh, to not let that law pass. And so, so I contacted them, and what they said is, you know, meet your city council people. You know, let them know your heart and rally up the troops. You know, because we can see these issues and it can anger us. And we can just continue to sit there and do nothing about it. Yes. Or we can see these issues and say, you know what, how can I be a part of the solution? And us as a church, we need to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. For so long, the church had just kind of mm -hmm. stepped back and said, I don't really want to be involved. Mm -hmm. But you know what, church, it's time that we get active. It's time that we get active. You want to know why the homosexual community has such a strong and powerful voice? Because it doesn't matter what walk of life they come from. They all come in agreement for one thing, their rights to be homosexual. And that's why their voice is so loud. That's why they can be black, they can be white, they can be Hispanic, they can be Chinese. It doesn't matter what religion or uh, what religion, what race they come from. It don't matter what kind of walk of life they come from. They come together and, and agree on one thing, that they have rights. And we as a church, we haven't got there yet. We haven't got there yet. We're still divided. We can't even agree to, to worship in the same place at the same time. And so we're a divided church, and it's time for the church to become united. It's time for the church to say, you know what, we are one body. And we have a voice, and our voice matters. It matters because Jesus Christ died on the cross for it. That's the only reason we have a voice, is because Jesus died on the cross so that we can have a voice for the gospel. Amen? And so there's all these issues going on right now, church, and what are we going to do? I can't allow my focus to be to say, you know what, I hate Trump, I'm for him, I'm against him. That can't be the focus of, of, my ish, of, of my, mm -hmm. where my heart is. The, my heart has to be focused on Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and, and the real issues. Mm -hmm. What is the real issues? There's families being torn apart. Mm -hmm. There's kids that are, are, that are suffering, not just at the border, but throughout the world, all over the place. And church, what are we going to do? Amen. Amen. That was not my um, anything to do with my message. It's just something that was on my heart, you know, to, to speak about. You know, the issues, the issues that we're dealing with today in today's society is hatred, and, and most of that is the church. There was church. I posted this thing. I had it. I had to delete it because it was just going on and on and on. I'm like, you know what? I never want to post anything. It just causes argument and chaos. But at the same time, it was it was a post that that, that pricked people's heart. You know, and it made the, the it surfaced the real issue. I'm filled with hatred. Mm -hmm. It's not about the president. I'm filled with hatred. I hate this man, and I don't want him to be my president. And I refuse to call him my president. And I'm a Christian. No, you're not. Hey, you have to speak the truth. No, you're not. You have to speak the truth. Mm -hmm. You are not a Christian. Not by biblical terms. You might say you're a Christian. But you can say whatever you want to say all day long. But when you stand before, or when you're compared to Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. If you're that filled with hate, that I can just say one name, and all of a sudden your skin starts to boil. Blood starts to boil. I had Christians that didn't want to comment on Facebook so, so that they wouldn't be seen public, but they called me on the phone. Is this where we're at? And angry. Angry, very angry, very upset. And I had to calmly talk to them. I said, that's not the issue. The issue, they said, well, I said, what I'm saying, if you see past your hatred, if you see past the hate in your heart, 
you'll see that what I'm really saying is that these issues have been exposed and what are we gonna do about it? It's not about Trump, it's not about Obama, it's not about Clinton, it's about we are, God has exposed some atrocities that are happening right here in our country. Mm -hmm. And what are we gonna do about it? Mm -hmm. We have to come together, sure. filled with hatred. How can I hate another man and say I love Christ? Mm -hmm. How can I say, how can I call myself a Christian and be a part of division? I can't. It was, I mean, there was some, there was some people that were posting that were atheists. They didn't believe in, they believe in God, but they believe in their made up, their, their man-made God. Where they don't believe in the whole sin thing, but they believe in God. But there was other Christians that were posting, or not posting, but calling me, and they were called, they called in, in fury. They said, brother, you I love you with my whole heart, but I need to tell you the truth. And then when they were done telling me the truth, I said, I love you too. I said, and I need to tell you the truth. You're filled with hatred, and that's not God. That's it. It's not God. I said, that's a different God that you're serving. Mm -hmm. I said, in fact, that's a spirit that you allowed mm -hmm. to manifest hatred. And that's the truth. That's the truth, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm filled with hatred, I could be nice to you all day long, but something, you say one word, do one thing, and you see the spirit of hatred boil up and just begin to just spew out of my mouth hatred. My eyes change, my face changes, my, my continent changes, and I'm just this filled with hatred. That's a spirit. That's a spirit. But I say I love Jesus. And I say I'm a Christian. Amen? I just wanted to bring that up because this is what we're dealing with today. And as Christians... We have to come to a place where we say, God, you're right and I'm wrong. Amen. In every area of our life. Amen. Mm -hmm. So today I want to talk about a little bit about freedom. And because this is something that the Lord has been dealing with in my heart. And I don't believe that this message is complete yet. But he's been dealing with me with this thing for a couple weeks. And, um, and it's freedom. I mean, and the definition of freedom is the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. That was what the definition of freedom came. And when I thought freedom, I said, I'm going to look it up, and it's going to talk about Jesus on the cross and freedom from sin and freedom from, from uh, bondage and, and all these things. And that's what I thought it was going to say. But that's not what it said. It says it's, the definition of freedom was the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. And when I started to think about that, I started, you know, and I understand what I'm saying. You know, I might say a couple of things that might sound okay, well, let me process that. But I really thought about what I'm saying, Lord, what am I saying, you know? And, and so the definition of freedom, even though it wasn't what I initially thought it was going to be, I started, God revealed to me that because Jesus died on the cross, he gave us freedom to choose. He gave us the right. He gave us the right to, 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 to act and operate in freedom. Whether that freedom means, God, I surrender my whole heart to you and, and, and I receive you as Lord and Savior, or I choose to reject you and serve other gods. He gave us that right when he died on the cross. You know, even though when he died on the cross, he did it so that, that humanity could be, be one back to the Father. But in the reality, when we really start thinking, Jesus died on the cross to give us freedom. And that freedom as humans, we have the right to choose or to reject. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. What I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Jesus gave his life so that we can have, um, so we can have life breaking the curse of sin and making a way for freedom from flesh and the power of the devil. That's what he came. He came to seek, seeking to save the lost. Amen. John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's why Jesus came. He came to die on the cross. He came to give his life as a ransom, so that those that believe would have eternal life. And we have that right. We have that. that he, that's why he died, to say, you know what, I have the right to be free. I have freedom in Christ. He died on the cross so that I can be free. But then there will be others that reject him. And that's their right. 
They have that right. I mean, and as crazy as that sounds, that's the right that they have to say, you know what, I reject him. I don't, I'm never going to receive him. Amen? Yeah. Am I on the right track? Is this, or is, is this conflicting to what anybody... No, go ahead. <laughs> because in the reality, he, he gave us the right. Jesus on the cross, it, it, there's so much more to, to his dying on the cross, his sacrifice. He gave us that right. And I think about the two thieves. One of them received him. One of them rejected him. Right. He had that right. He had that right. That's why he was there on the cross. I, I'm here on the cross to seek to save the lost, to, to give my life as a ransom that whoever believes will have everlasting life. And one of the, the, the criminals said, remember me. Remember me. He says, today you will be in paradise with me. He gave him that right by dying on the cross. It meant so much more. And, and Jesus is on the cross. And he dies so that we can have freedom. That we can have freedom. That we can have liberty. Amen. And freedom looks different to so many people. If you talk to 10 different people, you can say, what, if I ask in this room, what does freedom mean to you? you know, because we're all Christians, we might, all of us should have the same mindset of what we believe freedom to be. But if you ask random people, what does freedom look like to you? And freedom to every person, it looks different. You know what I mean? Some people, you know, I have talked to, to different people, I've known different people, and, I, and I've known people that were institutionalized and, and I know people that have got out of prison and they say that was the most horrible experience I've ever went through. You know, being locked up and being in prison, you know, being told what to do, when to eat, how to eat, where, you know, what, where to go, when to go, you know, and, and then living in the chaos of just criminals, criminal activity. And they say when they get out, when they got out, they said that was the most horrible thing I ever experienced. And, and I felt freedom walking out that door. Freedom for one man. That's what freedom looked like for one man. But to another man that I, I, I know and I talk to, he says, I feel imprisoned when I'm out here. I feel trapped. I feel overwhelmed when I'm walking free. I mean, when I'm walking outside the walls of prison, I only feel freedom when I'm sitting inside a prison. And that's a person that's institutionalized. But to him, he feels more free in prison than he does walking out here on the streets. And so freedom looks different for different people. And so for one, freedom looks like, you know, I'm outside these walls. I'm not restrained by guards and police and, and all this craziness. And I can walk around and make my own decisions. I can eat when I want to eat. I can sleep when I want to sleep. I can do what I want to do. Out here, I'm free. But to another man, he will say, you know what? That's not freedom to me. I feel more free when I'm inside, when I'm confined, when I, I'm told what to do, when, when I'm told what to eat. I'm, I have this mindset. I'm institutionalized. And there's, I'm not overwhelmed by the things of the world and life and decisions. And, and uh, what's it called? When you get old, you have... You have to get a job. You have to pay your rent. You know, they don't have responsibility. And it's easier for them. It's easier to be locked up in a prison cell where I don't have any responsibilities. All I got to do is get up, change, eat my, eat my food, go out there for an hour, do whatever, and then eat lunch. And that routine, that to them, that's freedom. And so to every person that you talk to, freedom might look a little bit different. Amen? You know, to some people, they will say freedom... You know, I, I, growing up in a homosexual community, I've talked to so many young boys that they said freedom came to them the day they were able to expose themselves. When they were able to, to, to come out of the closet and tell their parents, you know what, I'm a homosexual. I, I'm attracted to men. And, and their parents either received it or rejected, but the thing was is they felt freedom telling, exposing that thing, and now they're living that life. They say that's freedom. I'm not bound. I don't have to be in the closet. I don't have to live in secret anymore. I'm free. Amen. Where somebody else will say, I'm living this life. I'm living a life as a homosexual and, and I've been sleeping with all these men and I'm living this life and, and I feel trapped. I feel bound. I don't feel, I don't feel free. You know, there's, I feel like there's something missing. And, and, and the Lord says those, they will find freedom in Christ. And so for every person, freedom looks different. For me, freedom looked like when I was the, when he broke the chains of homosexuality, that was freedom for me. When he broke the chains of addiction, that was freedom to me. When he broke the, the chains of insanity, that was freedom to me. Where other people will say, that's not freedom to me. That's not freedom. They would say, you're a slave to a God that you don't even know exists. That's what people will sometimes say. I'd rather be a slave to my own flesh. I'd rather be a slave to myself. You know, and they say, freedom to me looks different. Freedom to me says, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want to do it. And that's a sense of freedom to them. Amen? Mm. 
It says, I believe true freedom is found in the presence of God. Amen. The real encounter with Jesus Christ, complete surrenderance to Christ, recognizing His deity as Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. I believe that that's when we experience true freedom. It's in, it's in that encounter with, with Jesus Christ when, when I come to that place and I realize that, you know what, this is the King of Kings, this is the Lord of Lords, and I surrender my whole heart, and that's complete freedom. That's complete freedom in that place. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. Uh, chapter 16. I'm going to read uh, 16 through 40. And this is probably more of what I'm really wanting to read, but I just want to read the whole, uh, the whole text. Amen? Amen. It says, Now what happened as we went to prayer, that a certain a slave girl possessed with a, a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and, Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that, ve- and, yeah, and he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of, of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and, and dragged them into the marketplace to, to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them and the, and, and the magistrates, tore off their clothes, and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding their jailer to keep them secure, <coughs> securely. He received, having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet to, into the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening, or, yeah, awakening from the sleep, seeing the prisoner's door open, so, you know, supposing that the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were there in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their, their, uh, washed their stripes. And immediately he and all of the, his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he, was, and he rejoiced having uh, believed in God with all the household. And when his... And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officer, saying, Let those men go. So the keeper of the prisoner, or in the prison, reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul says to them, They have beaten us openly, un- 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 uncondemned Romans, and they have thrown us into prison, and, not, and now do they... Sorry. And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. And uh, the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the, the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Amen. Amen. So here's Paul and Silas. And there's this woman that's demon possessed and she's following them and she's saying, these are the, these are the men, are servants of the most high God. 
and she kept on and on. And Paul got aggravated. He got, he was like, enough. You know what I mean? He started to get upset and, and he rebuked that spirit and the spirit came out and the masters were upset. Instead of rejoicing that somebody received deliverance, somebody received freedom, they were upset because like, that's our money. And that's why like, when you go out to the streets and you try to talk to prostitutes, the pimps are like, that's my money. That's my money. You're not taking food off my table. It's the same mindset. It's the same spirit. They were so upset with Paul and Silas that they rebuked that spirit and they weren't concerned about the woman that was possessed and was tormented. She had to go through. All they were concerned is that this woman speaks from demons and she says things that, that, that people will pay us money to hear. And so they were using this woman. Amen. But Paul cast that demon out and so now they're upset because now you just took from our plate. Now you just took from our table. They're upset. They're mad. And so what did they do? They beat Paul and Silas, and they threw him into prison. And the Bible says at midnight they were singing songs, and they were praying. And we're talking about prison. You know, we're talking about prison. I know when I went to jail, I was not singing songs, and I was not praying. Amen. I was praying, Lord, get me out of here. That's all I was doing. I was not in, in a place where, oh, this is, you know, I'm confined. I'm behind bars. I'm in, 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 a, in, a, in a place where everybody's completely chaotic and, and, and insane, and everybody wants to kill each other. It's just chaos in here. This is a great place just to be in peace. That's not what I was thinking. That's not what was going through my mind. I was watching people die at my feet. I was being threatened that people were going to kill me. I had the cops lying about me, saying that I was involved with some gang, and they put me in a place with rival gang members. I was not in a place of peace. It was not a place where I wanted to be. Is I certainly wasn't going to sit there and sing songs. You know what I mean? But here at Paul and Silas, they were beaten. They were beaten. And they were thrown into prison, and they said, let's pray, and let's sing songs. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. That's complete peace. Mm -hmm. That's what, what happens when you encounter the true living God, when you encounter Christ, and you have that freedom to have peace. You know, that's what true freedom looks like. That's what true peace looks like when you encounter God. And no matter what your situation is, no matter where you're at, what trial, what tribulation you're going through, you can have peace knowing that you're not there alone, that Jesus is with you. That Jesus is with you. Amen? That's a great place to be. That's when you know that I've encountered the real God because it don't matter what my world looks like. It doesn't matter what my situation is. It don't matter what storm I'm going through. It don't matter what mountain I'm climbing right now. I know that I'm not alone, and I know that I'm with Jesus, and his promise is that he will be my help. He says in Isaiah, he says, I am the Lord your God. He says, I take you by the right hand, and I help you. That's a promise I can stand on. It don't matter what I'm facing. Yeah, my flesh might want to react. My flesh might want to respond. But then my spirit reminds me that I have a God that promised me that you don't have to be afraid. I'm taking you by your hand, and I'm going to help you. And suddenly a peace will come over me, saying, God, I know that you're in complete control. I have no answers for the next few minutes, God, but I know that you have everything in your control. God, I just trust you. And that's a peace that we can have knowing Christ. Amen? So I believe that true freedom is found in, in the presence of God, the real encounter with Jesus Christ, complete surrenderance deity to Christ, recognizing his deity as Lord and Savior. I believe that that's the place, when we come to that place, that's where true freedom is. That's where true freedom is. And it don't matter if I'm walking the streets or it don't matter if I'm locked up in some little hole right in the middle of the darkest place in prison. When I know Christ and I know that he died on the cross to set me free, that's true freedom. That's true freedom. And, and we can't, there's not a place here on earth that, that if you really know God, if you really know Christ, if you really have that relationship, there's no place here on earth that I can be, whether good or bad, that I have to be. See, this chaos is overwhelming me. I know that, I, you know, because I know Christ, no matter where I end up, God, I know that you're with me and I have peace. I have peace. I'm in complete freedom. I might be bound with chains, I might be behind prison walls, I might be in an institute, I might be in, in a hospital, I'm at wherever I'm at, I'm completely free. What you see in the natural, doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't override what's going on in the spirit. Because if my spirit is free, no matter what you do to me, no matter how you try to confine me, I'm free. And you can't steal that from me because Jesus Christ died on the cross to give it to me. Amen? 
That's true freedom. Paul and Silas, they were in this place. Mm -hmm. They were in this place and they knew what true freedom meant. True freedom wasn't, wasn't defined, you know, walking the streets. True freedom wasn't confined about, you know, making your own decisions. True freedom was, was, uh, was found in their relationship with Christ, knowing Christ. And even though they were beaten, even though, though they were in a prison, it, it, they were completely free. Amen? And that's where we have to get to know that we're completely free. It says in James 1, 2, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. <clears throat> How can you consider it joy when you're going through a trial? Because you know that Jesus Christ is there with you. Amen? Amen. You know, so many times we can get caught up in going through trials and tribulations, losing hope. You know, sometimes that trials and tribulations, if you're a parent, sometimes that trial and tribulation looks like my children are, are you know, wandering. You know, they, they used to go to church. They used to sing songs. They grew up knowing the, reading the Bible. But now they're at a certain age where they say, you know what, I don't really want to live that kind of life. And, and now they're just kind of drifting off. And, and you try to hold on to them, but they're making their own decisions. Say, you know what, it's, it's not for me. And that's a trial for a parent. Because now you see, oh, my kids are out there shooting drugs, hanging out with gangsters, you know, selling drugs, you know, prostituting, you know, living all these crazy ways, trying to, you know, do whatever they want to do. And it looks crazy. And, and it's a trial that a parent will have to endure, seeing their kid. What if my kid dies? You know, there's no, I'm not, pro, I, don't, I don't know for sure the life that my children are living that they're going to make it home today. You know, and that's a trial that we, that, we, that we have sometimes as parents. I'm an uncle. So I, I, I go through those, not like, they're not my children, but they're as close as I have to children. And so we, we see this, and, but I, we have to know that even in the midst of that trial, that God has a plan. God has a plan. I might not be able to ch change my, ch my children's mind, but I can get on my knees and go to the, to the God that can. Amen? Amen. And so no matter what trial, what tribulation, you know, the Bible says, count it all joy. Count it all joy. And you say, how can I count it joy? My children are, are out of control. How can I count it all joy? My husband's having an affair. How can I count it all joy? My wife, my wife is, is running off with another man. How can I count it all joy? I just lost my job. I'm losing my house. How can I count it all joy? Because we know Christ. And if we know Christ, we know God... My world is falling apart and it looks chaotic, but I know that you have a plan. Amen. I know that you have a plan. And I have to trust in that. And that's where true freedom comes. Because no matter what trials, what tri tribulations hit us, we're not going to be bound by that. You know, no matter where we end up in life, you know, we lose our house. or Whatever happens, we end up in jail. No matter what happens, we have to trust that, God, you have a plan. We have, you know, if this law passes, it's going to be illegal for us to preach the gospel, to evangelize. And if we continue to do it, because I know we will, even though we, it's, it's, they, they say we can't, we're still going to preach the gospel because we believe in our heart that that's why Jesus Christ died, so that we can continue the work. He said, greater things will you do. Greater things will you do. And so we're going to carry on doing the same thing. How can I say the gospel doesn't work after a woman stopped on the side of the road to preach the gospel to me in the middle of a suicide mm -hmm. attempt. Mm -hmm. How can you tell me it's offensive? How can you tell me it doesn't mm -hmm. work? I'm living proof. I'm, yeah. I shouldn't be speaking to you. I shouldn't even be alive. I should be, bring, I should be buried somewhere, either burning or on my way to, to hell. That's where I should be. But because one woman stopped to preach the gospel, she says, in her mind, I know that this man, if he dies, he's going to die and he's going to go to hell. He needs the gospel. And what happened? She preached the gospel and it transformed, it changed my life. It changed my And so we know that the gospel is true. We know that the gospel works. And so if we're here and, and they pass this law saying you can't preach the gospel, you can't say Jesus can help you, you're going to go to jail. Well, you know what? Then God must have a jail ministry for me because that's where I'm going. Peace and freedom is not defined whether you're in a jail or you're outside of a jail. That's not what freedom means. Freedom means is that we have freedom in Christ. That's where we find true freedom in Christ and what he's called us to do. This world is temporary. It's only like a drop in the bucket. 
It might seem like a long time, but I, I'm realizing now that I'm getting older, time's going by really fast. <laughs> time's going by really fast. It's already June. A half a year already went by. It seems like I just got back from Mexico. Now I have to start thinking, okay, I need to start getting ready to go back to Mexico again. And time is going by so fast, but you know, when you're little kids, it's just like, I'm bored. It seems like the day lasts forever. <laughs> this world is temporary. Our time here, has a, we have an expiration date here on this earth. And we need to preach the gospel. We need to remember why he died. We need to remember the, the, the new creation that he gave us, the new identity he gave us, and the work that he handed over to us as children of God. And so we have to understand what it means to truly be free. Truly being free means I'm no longer a slave to the devil. I'm no longer bound by drug addiction and insanity and sexual perversions. I'm not bound. I'm free. And regardless if I'm inside of a jail or if I'm walking these streets, you know, I don't have to be a prisoner in my own mind anymore. I'm free. I'm free. And I found that freedom in Christ. Amen. Counter it, pure joy. Have you got to that place where you've counted it, you've a, you're able to count it joy when it seems like, Lord, somebody stole all my money. Lord, somebody stole my idea. You know, when we are attached to worldly things and worldly systems, we're not free. We're bound. And we have to understand that nobody can take anything out of my hands unless God says they can have it. Yeah. It doesn't belong to me. And if somebody takes something from me that don't belong to them, it belongs to me, then you don't think God ain't going to give it back to me? We have to rest and, be, and know that, you know what, I found freedom knowing that, you know what, this world can't do anything to me. I mean, you could kill me, but you're only sending me home. You're only sending me home. And I'm not saying just go outside and say, kill me, kill me. I'm not saying anything like that, but if we do get killed, the reality is, is we go home to be with our Father. That's, right. That's, right. That's freedom. That's a freedom mindset. And when you, be, when you have that freedom mindset inside you, you're free. Amen. Nothing can move you. Nothing can move you. You can't take anything from me. I'm not attached to it. You're not stealing from me. You're stealing from God. That's true. You know, I learned that principle when I wrote that book and that woman stole it from me. I learned that principle. It never belonged to me. And God said, and if I want to take ownership of it, he said, keep it. I don't need it. That's what the Lord said. I wrote this book. This woman stole the copyright. She did all these things, and I was disturbed, moved to the point where crying because my family kept saying, don't trust her, don't trust her, don't trust her. And I just, what do you call it? I, uh, what's that word when you, uh, I defended her. I said, she's a woman of God. She goes to church. God told her, and I defended her, and I defended her. I told my family, you're wrong. You're wrong about this woman, and she did exactly what they warned me she was going to do. As a Christian, a Christian woman. And I got to that place where I felt like, you know, she's, I, was, I was robbed. I felt like, you know, I felt all those different things, those different emotions were coming up. And, you know, and, and, and to the point where I just began to cry in my room at, three, at 12 o'clock at night. And then I clearly heard the Lord say, he says, why are you so upset? I said, God, she stole from me. She took something from me that didn't belong to her. She violated. And the Lord says, I thought you said when you wrote this book that you wanted it, you were writing it for me. I said, I did. And he goes, well, then what does it matter whose name's on it? What does it matter who, belong, who the book belongs to? And he says, if you can't put this book in my hand and have peace in your heart, he says, keep it. I don't need it. That's what the Lord said. Wow. And I'm still angry. And I'm still thinking, this lady, I know where she lives. And I'm still thinking, you know, I could have her house burned down. And I'm still thinking all these crazy things. Why? Because I'm still a human being. Yeah. And I was a new Christian through two or three years in, in Christianity. And so I'm thinking all these things. And at 3 o'clock, a peace came over me. And, and, and after I got done crying and, and wanting to, to argue with God and all these things, I, a peace came over. I said, God, you can have it. I did my part <laughs> I wrote the story. She can put her name on it. She can have it. It all belongs to you. Amen. It's all for you, God. The next morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, that woman called me. She said, something happened about 3 o'clock in the morning. 
<coughs> something woke me up and said that I needed to give you the copyrights to this book back. Wow. Well, that was the Lord. Because when I called the publishing company, yes. they said, Mr. Contreras, they said, this book does not belong to you. You need to ask so-and-so and such-and-such -and -such because legally she owns the copyrights to this book. And that's when I began to go through this spiral of emotion. But when I got done crying and I got done being a little kid and I got done throwing my little tantrum, I said, God, it all belongs to you. It all belongs because he reminded me that's not where you find your freedom. You found your freedom on the side of the road when you encountered my son. Yes, yes, That's you. what true freedom is. Thank you, Don't try to hold on to something. Don't try to be bound by something. And, and I realized, you know, God, you're so right. This book has nothing to do with, with the, the, the true freedom that I found in a relationship with Christ. Nothing to do with it. Mm. And I gave her this book and God gave it back to me. I own the copyrights of the book. Mm. That's because God, because I found peace. Nobody can steal anything from you. And if they do, it's okay because they're not stealing from you. They're stealing from God. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And we can't fight with people. We can't argue with people. When I'm bound to something, when I'm attached to worldly things, that's when it comes like, I'm not letting this lady steal my book. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden the flesh rises and I want to take ownership of something that doesn't belong to me. Yeah. The only thing that belongs to me is what Jesus did on the cross. Mm -hmm. My freedom that I, I, I have in my relationship with Jesus. That's what I own. That's what I belong he, I, the, blood of, the blood that was shed on the cross for me. That's all that I need to focus on. Nobody can steal that. Yes. Nobody can take that from you. That belongs to you. Mm. He did that for every one of us. And nobody can take that from us. All these other things, it's just worldly stuff. Mm. It's just worldly stuff. And so here Paul and Silas, Silas, they're in this prison. And they said, you know what? This prison doesn't, come, doesn't define freedom to us. Yeah. It's not what, what we, we see freedom... Freedom is it, that we're going to preach the gospel, that we know Jesus Christ, that we know that when we leave this earth, that we're going to spend an eternity in heaven with our Lord and our Savior, and we'll be in our right place forever and ever and ever. <coughs> that's where you find complete freedom. When that's your focus, when that's your understanding, nobody can tear you down, nobody can break you down, nobody can knock you down. You get knocked down, but you get right back up. Why? Because nobody could take the true freedom that Christ died on the cross for you to have. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to get into the next part because it would take too long. But it goes into the um, it goes into the Israelites, and when Moses, God told Moses, "Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, so they can worship me." Amen. And when they finally were able to be released, what did they say? They were in the desert. Why have you brought us out here to die? Mm. They started to complain. They had that prison mentality. Freedom to them looked like we're better off being slaves. We're better off being fed when they want to feed us, being told what to do. And God wanted to set them free, but they didn't understand what true freedom looked like. Amen. They wanted to be in prison. They wanted to be, they had that mindset of it's better to, to have them feed us when we know that they're going to feed us. It's better to, to lean on a man, on, on, uh, on a master, than to, 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 to trust God in this desert place, in this wilderness, where we're going to die. I don't know that God is going to meet us tomorrow. It, will God provide for us tomorrow? We know for sure that our masters will, will feed us. We know that, that, that they have, we have a place to sleep. All these things, even though they were treated bad, they were slaves, they were, they were you know, beaten, they were all these things. It was they had that mindset, take us back. It's better for us to be there than to be out here to die. Mm -hmm. You see the mindset that we have? We, we don't know what true freedom looks like. You know, you even talk to some prostitutes and they'll tell you, I can't leave my pimp. I can't, what would I do without him? Yeah, he beats me. Yeah, he treats me bad. Yeah, he has all these other women and all this stuff's going on. But, but that's where my freedom, that's what freedom looks like to me. We have this mindset that doesn't have anything to do with the freedom that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for us. And so church, we have to find that place. We can't be like the Israelites just wandering around and in today's time say, you know what, it was better when I was doing this. It was better when I was doing that. There's a lot of things that I can say about, you know, even being with men. It was better to be in a relationship with a man even though he was putting hands, you know, we were beating each other up, you know, just destroying each other's property, we still burn each other. It was chaotic, but it was, it was better because at least I knew there was somebody that loved me or that I thought loved me. 
I could, I could be in that mindset. You know what? It, I want to, I'd rather be with in that lifestyle. I'd rather be with that. To me, that's freedom to be in a place where, where I believe, even though it's dysfunctional, but it's the only kind of love I understand. But God brought me to a place where I said, that's not freedom. That's not freedom. Freedom doesn't look like you can sleep with as many men as you want to. That's not freedom. That's bondage. That's bondage. I was a sin. I was a slave to sin. Freedom looks like I have the freedom to be free in Christ. And when I find that freedom in Christ, nothing moves us. When you find that freedom in Christ, nothing will move you. Yeah, somebody will come and lie to you at work and you lose your job, but you know what? I'm not moved by that because I know that God has something better for me. God is not, I'm not going to be a child of God and God's going to say, I'm going to let you lose everything. And if he does, it's for a purpose and for a reason. It's for a purpose and for a reason. Maybe we're attached to some stuff. And God says, you know, there's, I can't be in competition with this house. I can't be in competition with this title. You say I'm your God. You say that you surrendered your whole heart, but I, I have to compete with this thing. And God says, I don't want to compete with that thing, so I'm just going to allow, I'm going to allow you to lose it all. And it's in that place where you have nothing that you say, you look and say, you know what? I have God. I have God. And sometimes the best place to be is at the bottom when everything else fails, all your attempts to succeed and to gain and to have, when everything fails, God still has a plan. God still has a plan. Amen. There's a brother, there's a brother that's going through a really, really, really hard time right now. He's completely vaccinated, completely lost his mind, completely drug addicted. And the church is like, this is crazy, this is crazy. I, I can't understand how he got this far, he, you know, he fell this far down. And I said, what you don't understand, I said, in all that chaos, that's a beautiful place for him to be. Because it's in that chaos, God is allowing all that childhood stuff to surface. And he has to deal with it now because it's operating, it's, it's operating in his life. You know, it's, it's a 24-hour it's a, it's a manifestation where now he's moving in this, this the, the hurt and the pain and the rejection that was happening as a little kid and now it's surfaced and now he's completely broken. Now he's completely lost, but it's not, it's in that place where you're completely lost and completely broken where you can, where it's so dark that the light of Jesus Christ is so bright. Amen. And so what people don't understand is even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of something, a situation where that doesn't make absolutely no sense to me, that looks so dark and that looks so chaotic, and that's where God begins. That's where God can start. And so that is a beautiful place. You know, and I tell people that, and I'm like, brother, I don't understand that. I'm like, well, when you get to that place, you'll understand. You'll understand. I was able to understand that because it t- that's what it took for me to, to see Christ. In all my brokenness, in all my attempts to succeed, everything failed. Nothing worked. Everything was a dead end. And that's when I realized what I can't, where I stopped, that's where God began. And that's when God said, let me take over and I'll do it. And so in our, the chaos, we have to come to that place where complete peace, knowing that I have freedom in Christ. Amen? Mm-hmm. And John 8, 36, it says, so if the Son, or who the sin, I'm sorry. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen? If he sets you free, who, how, why would you think that you're not? Amen? When you, when you become a Christian and you say, Jesus Christ is Lord. See, that's why a lot of people, they jump. They jump and say, oh, yeah, I surrender. I, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But have no intentions of getting to know him, changing their life, or allowing him to be Lord and Savior. They just say the words just to say it. Maybe they were, you know, they felt led because everybody said, you got to say it. You got to say it. For whatever reason, they did it. Amen? But for those that truly believe the word of God, you know, it was, it was in that scripture, it, what was it, correct me if I'm wrong, 2 Corinthians 6, 19 or 9, 6, uh, where, it says, um, where it says, you know, some of you were drunkards and homosexuals and, and uh, but you were uh, washed, you were cleansed and you were sanctified by the, by the spirit of God. You know the scripture? I think it's 2 Corinthians 6, 9 or 6, 19, somewhere around there. It wasn't until I read that scripture, says, but this is who you, some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified. When I read that scripture, it brought truth to me. Because it says some of you were homosexuals. Some of you were living that life. 
but because of, of Christ, because of the Holy Spirit, you were washed, you were cleansed. Amen? And I saw that scripture, and that's when it became a reality to me. I don't have to be a homosexual no more. I was washed. I was cleansed. That's not who I am. I have an identity, and that identity comes in Christ. But see, first I have to come to the place where I said, I believe that the word is God in, in, in word form. I believe that the word of God is complete truth. And I will, in every area of my life, say, God, you're right and I'm wrong. So when I read something in the Bible that contradicts what I, my mindset is saying, I know that I need to change my mind because this is truth and this is a lie. Mm-hmm. When we come to that place where we can read the scripture, we're so convinced. I'm so convinced, God, that you're right and I'm wrong. In every area of my life, God, you said that I was washed, I was cleansed. I'm not that person anymore. I'm not filthy. I'm not dirty. I'm sanctified. Why? Because the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. And we get to that point in life where we say, you know what? The word of God is truth. And when I read the word of God, I can stand on that promise. I can stand on that foundation knowing that it's true. And so when the world tries to come against me, tries to say this, tries to say, no, I don't believe that lie because the Bible says this. But you could only get there by coming to a place where say, you know what, God, you're right and I'm wrong. Amen. You're right and I'm wrong. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yes, there is freedom. If the, we say that the word is true, and we say that because there's two or more here gathered, that the spirit of God is here with us, there's freedom here. There's freedom here. When we come into a place, maybe we come bound with mindsets and understandings and, and we're still dealing with rejections and hurts and pains. But, you know, when we say that now the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of God is, if the spirit of the Lord is here, there's freedom. There's freedom. We find freedom in the spirit of the Lord. And so we either believe that or we don't. You know, and I can take this scripture and I can take this word and I can take this promise. And if I'm behind prison walls, I can still stand on the same foundation. I'm free. These walls and these bars don't dictate, they don't, they, they, it doesn't, it's not going to dictate to me whether I'm, I, I'm free or I'm bound. I'm free because of Christ, not because I'm in a prison cell. I'm not free because I could wander the streets, I could walk out of this house at any time that I want to. That doesn't mean that I'm free because I could be imprisoned in my mind. But I know that I have freedom because the Word of God says I'm free. That there's freedom. In this, wherever the spirit is amen? amen and then whoever the son says free you're free indeed when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior we became free amen. we experienced a freedom that the world can't offer we experienced a freedom that, 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 that Satan can't convince us you know that, that we can have a part of I don't need that freedom I need Jesus amen, amen. and so we're free amen amen Father, we thank you today for this word. Lord, I hope that it was, uh, that it made sense to anybody. Father, I pray that you would give us revelation, Lord God, that we are free, Lord. God, we are not bound by worldly systems. God, we're not bound by lies, Lord God. We're not bound by the enemy, God, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and, we, and he gave his life so that we can have life, that, that when we received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God, we came to a place of complete freedom complete freedom. And Lord, I make a decision today to walk in freedom, the freedom that I have in Christ. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that you would reveal, God, every lie, Lord God, operating in our lives, Lord God, that contradict that we have freedom, that contradict your your word or your promise that you have for us, Lord, as children, God. God, I pray, God, that if we have confessed you as Lord and Savior, Lord God, but that, God, we don't really know your word. We don't know, the, we don't know to compare the, the truth to the lie. Lord, I pray, God, that you would give revelation, God. God, that you would give discernment, Lord God, to the word, Lord God, that we would, Lord God, meditate on your word, God, that we would recognize what the true word really says so that we have something to compare the lie to. God, and I pray, God, from this day forward, God, God, that you would give us an understanding that we're free, Lord. That we're free. But Lord, there's even a scripture, Lord God, that that Paul talked about. He says, I'm a slave to righteousness. Lord, if we're going to be bound, if we're going to be slaves, let us be slaves unto you. Let us be slaves to righteousness. Let us be bound by you, God. 
God, because you know what's best for us, Lord. You love us more than we can ever love ourselves, Lord. I can't, Lord God, I can't draw a blueprint of what I want my life to look like. Lord, you know so much better than I do what I need in, as a life. And so, Lord, I just pray, Lord God, that you would continue, God, to show us, reveal us to us, God, God, that, that we have freedom in you, God. And it doesn't matter, God, what, what I'm seeing, God, what this reality looks like. Lord, I'm free. I'm free, and nobody can steal this freedom. Nobody can take this. I can give it away, but nobody can take it from me. And, Lord, I'm not giving my freedom because it means too much to me what Jesus left so that he could come die on a cross. God, it means so much to me that Jesus would die a horrible death to win me to you. God, and that's not something that I'm just willing to give up. That's something that I'm not just willing to give away. God, I love you, God, and, and I know the church loves you, God. And God, we need you, God. God, we need you, God. And so we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.